Hi everyone. So this is one of the last topics where we actually look at where crime comes from or look to explain crime. And it's actually a really, really short one um, because it's just old stuff rehashed and stuffed into a new topic. So it's psychodynamic explanations. So they're explanations that look to childhood for answers and specifically we're going to be looking at Freud and Bowlby. Now the reason this is going to be a short lesson is because you should know all there is to know about Freud and all there is to know about Bowlby as well. So anything new from this lesson should just slip easily into the knowledge that you already have about those two uh, topics. So if you think you don't know your stuff on Freud or your stuff on Bowlby, then I would recommend just going back to my lessons on both of those topics and watching the videos on those, just to re-familiarize yourself with what we did there. Okay, so just to get you going, I'm just going to remind you a little bit of some of the important things um, about Freud. So you had this idea of the tripartite of personality. So the fact that your personality is actually split into three, your animalistic id that works off the gratification or instant gratification principle, your ego, which works off a reality principle and mediates between the other two, and then your superego, which is your morality principle and develops the latest. Your superego and your id are constantly in conflict. Your id wants everything all of the time and your superego is trying to stop you making mistakes and your ego has to mediate between the two. You've then got this idea of defense mechanisms. So the fact that the, your id and ego, superego, sorry, being in conflict um, creates anxiety and your ego uses defense mechanisms such as repression and denial to help deal with those anxieties. And then finally, you've got the psychosexual stages, the fact that people or infants progress and develop through a series of stages where they have a fixation and they have to resolve that fixation in order to healthily pass on to the next stage. Now, again, if those things are a little bit complicated or you can't remember some of the stuff that we did on that, then I would recommend going back to the video on the psychodynamic approach just to refresh your memories on those things. Now, the important bit for crime is the superego because psychodynamic explanations for crime tend to focus on the superego because it is the um, the bit that's all about morality. So the superego develops at the end of the phallic stage with the resolution of the Oedipus or the Electra complex, just as a bit of background. Um, it develops at the age of five or around the age of five and it focuses on morality. Okay, so a person's sense of morality is always, according to Freud, internalized from the same sex parent. So a son will learn right from wrong morals and values from his father, whereas a daughter will learn those things from her mother. That's the idea behind it. So Staying on with the superego, according to Blackburn in 1993, there are actually three explanations for how a superego can lead you to criminal behavior. And they all focus around the idea that your superego is either deficient or it's underdeveloped, uh, which means that the id would have free reign to do whatever it wants because it isn't being suppressed by the superego or isn't being controlled anyway, by the little angel on your shoulder. So the three things that could become an issue are having a weak superego, having a deviant superego, or having an over-harsh superego. And I'll go into how those things are an issue now. So having a weak superego comes from 
and the same-sex parent being absent during the phallic stage. If the same-sex parent is ab absent during that stage, when the superego is starting to develop, then the child is not able to fully internalize um, the morals and values from that same-sex parent. If they can't do that, then they're lacking in identification, and so they're unable to kind of make those decisions in terms of right and wrong, or they're unable to have fully internalized what is right and what is wrong and why. A deviant superego, on the other hand, um, comes, across, comes about when the same-sex parent is there, but the same-sex parent has deviant values. So by deviant, we mean um, criminal values, um, aggressive attitudes, racist attitudes, um, abusive attitudes, whatever you want, really. They just they tend to be fairly negative um, and deviant thoughts, thought processes, and values, which will then get passed on to the child. So the child will internalize a superego with immoral values, which means that they're more likely to turn to crime because they won't have learned that crime is wrong. And so if they do commit a crime or if they do something that's a little bit immoral, then their superego won't be making them feel guilty for it. Their superego will just be sat back thinking everything's fine. Now, this last one is a little bit more interesting, also a little bit more tricky to get your head around. So, a healthy superego should be a little bit like a kind but firm parent. So, there are rules to follow, and you should feel bad if you break them, and they'll make you feel bad if you break those rules. But at the end of the day, you're going to be forgiven for bad behavior, like a, like a good parent. But if your superego is over harsh, then it's more likely to be like an unkind and overly critical parent. Some research even suggests that an over harsh superhero did actually come from having an unkind and overly critical parent. So it's more likely to make you constantly second guess yourself, think negatively about yourself, be overly critical, uh, sorry, be overly self critical etc. It's also likely to be really, really punitive and cause crippling guilt for your behaviours, whether those behaviours are worthy of guilt or not. Um, you know, if those behaviours are worthy of guilt, then, you know, the guilt is going to be especially crippling. Now, having an internal voice that's that negative and that harsh can very often drive people to try and escape the internal voice um, by using techniques that are probably a little bit immoral, you know, turning to things like alcoholism, drug use, risky behavior, um, you know, that kind of thing, just to, just to kind of escape what's going on in your mind. Um, people with an over-harsh superego also will turn or could turn to criminal acts and the reason they turn to criminal acts is because they're trying to satisfy their superego's need for punishment so if you think back to how your personality actually drives your behavior if you think that your superego is driving your behavior and if you're not doing anything that's punishable your superego will make you do something that is punishable so that it can punish you. So it's you're carrying out a negative behavior so that you can be punished by your superego because your superego has this need for punishment. That's why an overly harsh superego can lead to criminal behavior. That's kind of the one that's most tricky to get your head around. But once you've got your head around it, it'll be fine. 
Okay, the final little bit, like I said earlier, is Bowlby. So if you think back to Bowlby's theory of attachment and how he talked about uh, the importance of a primary attachment giver, um, so he said that the ability to form meaningful relationships actually comes from um, having a warm and continuous relationship with a primary attachment figure during the critical period. And he also went on to say that failing to establish a maternal bond like that or a, an attachment bond like that could result in lasting and very often irreversible damage in later life. In terms of emotional issues that an infant could experience in later life, he went on to say that one of those things could be affectionless psychopathy. So this inability to uh, to feel guilt or empathy uh, and any kind of feelings for other people is very often a consequence of not having one of these bonds or one of these continuous warm bonds with a primary attachment figure. So people like that are likely to engage in acts of crime and delinquency um, because they haven't been able to develop close relationships and they actually can't develop close relationships with other people around them. So just as a, um, just as a quick memory jolt, um, he did his 44 Thieves study. So if you can't remember what the 44 Thieves study was, um, then you should definitely go back and have a little look at it. The gist of it was that he took um, some juvenile thieves and he had a little look um, at how often and how regularly they had been separated from their primary attachment giver uh, during the critical period and found that those who would be classed as affectionless psychopaths also had... Um, extended periods, per, periods of separation from their primary attachment giver during the critical period. So he drew a, a link between separation from primary attachment giver and delinquent criminal behaviour in later life. Again, if you can't remember the ins and outs of that study, then go back to the lesson or the video on Bowlby's theory of attachment um, or on Bowlby's maternal deprivation hypothesis and you will find all the information you need in there. Okay, I hope it's been useful. That is the end of the lesson. Thank you.